You are a product of your experiences, beliefs, environment, and more. And often this history leading up to who we are today can be filled with negativity and trauma. You are watching Influence Media, PSI TV, the Netflix of biz brands. My guest today has lived as both an enforcer of rules and a victim of rule enforcement. Dr. Melvin Mahone is a military vet, a former law enforcement team member, and an academic. Today, he shares his book, Coping with Stress and Building Leadership, One Man's Journey. I read his book. And I found it to be a combination of being both an autobiography, a kind of behind the scenes of what it's like to be a minority in the space of law enforcement, and an overview of, of coping with PTSD in a world where leaders need to function. Welcome, Dr. Mahone. Thank you, ma'am. Well put. All right. Well, thank you for being my guest today. So, Dr. Mahone, mental health has often been a taboo topic, especially for the men. And because the men tend to need to keep up the appearance of strength and stability. But I noticed that since COVID, the conversation on mental health has eased and it's become a little bit more normalized to discuss this challenge openly. But your book was released in 2011, long before COVID, when it was not quite as accepted to be so transparent about the struggles but you were very transparent in your book, Coping with Stress and Building Leadership, One Man's Journey. What gave you the strength to be so transparent at that time of your life? I felt talking about my trials and tribulations about PTSD, stress, depression, and paranoia would be good for therapy and would help other people with their mental health. That's the reason I was so transparent. Also, it's good not to be in denial when you have a mental problem. Admit you're having a mental problem, and then you can start therapy. It'll go, it'll go by smoother. I agree. Um, denial is huge. It, it stops a lot of people from seeking help. And stops that's denial was a reason I didn't accept disability from the Department of Justice. I said, there's nothing wrong with me. He said, Mel. You have PTSD, stress and depression and paranoia. You need disability. And I wouldn't listen to him. I, I left all my benefits and I did not get disability. And I regret that to, to this day. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, stress is a very sneaky feeling. It's so sneaky that some people don't even realize that some of the symptoms they're experiencing are actually a result of stress. The average person spends 40 hours a week at a job and your book had a very strong take on workplace stress being potentially harmful. Can you expand on that a little bit? Stress in the workplace can be harmful because of performance pressures, Overworking boredom. You're a prime candidate for stress related diseases if you're a well known type A personality and you're impatient, intolerant, and strive for perfection and success. That's what happened to me in the Department of Justice when I was in management and I had a secretary. My work would be caught up, but I, I, I would get, go beyond that. I would go an extra two or three weeks ahead of schedule for my schedule. I would be caught up an extra two or three weeks beyond that. And that was a, a sign of a type A personality perfectionist. Hmm. So do you think that that, that stress is still what, was that stress because of your boss or was that stress just because of your personality? My personality, not because of my boss. I wasn't the hand of my work. I was up uh, up to date with it, but I would always get get up uh, ahead of myself. Mm. And, the, and that would put more stress on the, on the secretary. 
Mm. So your book title was Coping with Stress and Building Leadership. So where does the leadership fit in? With the leadership fit in with the positions that I had while I was coping with stress. When I left the Department of Justice, I, I didn't stop working. I was a I was a uh, correctional treatment specialist, probation officer, parole agent, investigator, drug counselor, substance abuse counselor, educator, resident advisor. Uh, I was a paralegal. I was a social service career trainer. All those positions were leadership positions in the government. Okay. So some people get hired on, but when they're going through the whole HR process, they don't mention mental health stress uh, struggles or their triggers, and they're not even legally required to do that. So what about, what would you say about the organization that hires these people? Do you think an organization has any duty to the people that they employ uh, and discover later on that that person has any kind of mental health or challenge to do the job that they were actually hired to do. If, if something like that comes up as a leader, how do you suggest it is positively handled? Some people that have been hired have gotten a stress condition either before or after being employed by a company. I believe that company has a moral duty to address that problem once that person is hired on a moral obligation. They should set up programs for the employee when the person is, is stressed out. And, and the average federal agency does that. The agency that I just left to this day take my phone calls when I feel over or over stress. They 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 counsel me. I will agree with you that the governmental agencies do, especially the ones around um, the kind of work you did in law enforcement and military and all of that stuff, definitely do. But what about the general leadership in general organizations today? Because your book, that title is going to probably appeal to leadership across the board. So how does you know an organization that's not as big and as well-funded as the government what could they do? They can have they can have groups established for particular problems. If it's not law enforcement, if it is law enforcement, they're gonna have a backup there for you to go to get counsel. But I realized it would it would cost money for a lot of companies to have a a, a to have a referral system for their employees. When that happens, they can use their own insurance, health insurance that they have on their job to receive counseling. Yeah, and a lot of jobs don't even give any kind of benefits these days, so it gets even harder. Right. So you shared a story of racism while you were working in the prison system. And um, you shared several stories, but I'm particularly referring to that story you mentioned about marijuana being placed or planted on an inmate, and it was done unjustly. I wanted to share that story. Um, I have like more to that question, but let's start with you sharing that story. Well, I was on duty in a dormitory that night. And a white correction officer had a small bag of marijuana. He planted it on, on the uh, bunk of the inmate without the inmate being aware of it. The inmate show up, he's charged with possessing marijuana. When you walk into a prison, you don't know what you're walking into, even though if, even though you work there. If if I would have voluntarily told on him or turn him in, I probably would have suffered the consequences of for, for it uh, physically. Mm. 
I would probably walk into an institution but not be able to walk out of it alive. So that kind of activity was real. It's not just on TV. Right. That was real. Oh, wow. And my hands were tied. I couldn't do anything. Oh, wow. I couldn't well, do nothing. I couldn't help them. 24. And, right. you know, in my opinion, it's just my opinion. I don't have any facts to back this up. But in my opinion, I think slavery has taken a new form. It's the prison system. That's just my opinion. You've expressed helplessness watching what took place in the prison system. So in retrospect now, speak to the people of color. Speak to the people of color who work in that same system today. Is there a way to navigate that fairly? Is that even possible in 2024? I think, well, not what I think, but the way the uh, reality is now. We have civil rights organizations that will address that problem. ACLU, the prison organ, prison group, uh, other civil rights organizations specializing in the plight of people of color in the prisons when there's a problem like that. And I would turn to that civil rights organization to remedy that situation. So, wow. So you mentioned in your book, I'm, I'm quoting you now, happiness is an elusive, transitory thing. As someone, Dr. Mahone, who has suffered from PTSD and other stress-related experiences, would you say that you're happy now? And if yes, how did you find that happiness? I have found happiness through trial and error as a mental health client. I learned not to be in denial of, of a mental condition, but to be transparent, seek therapy, medication, and pray. You might notice in my book, I put, I used the Bible. I talked about Job. I talked about other uh, chapters in the Bible. I did that for a reason. That's part of being happy. I totally agree. So Dr. Mahone, coping with stress and building leadership, one man's journey. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Something I didn't ask you that you think you'd like to share? Well, I made a long journey and I'm still making a journey. I'll turn 73 in October. Uh, I still suffer from stress but I, but I now I know how to handle and control stress. I know what to look for. I know not to go too far in my thinking about about problems. I know when it's stress related. I said I said, oh, I can't do that because that's my stress condition talking. Or I can't do it this way. I have to do it this way. I learned through trial and error what to do, and that's the reason. I put happiness is an elusive transitory thing. And it is transitory. But you have to face up to it. Did you would you say you learned any of that from the therapeutic experiences? Both. Most through trial and error in therapy. You have to realize the VA is the largest hospital in the country. They handle thousands of cases of stress every day. I went through therapy with them since 1980. A lot of people don't get therapy. They, they don't get medicated. They suffer for nothing. I suffered until they found the right medication to give me to control the stress. I'll have a stress condition for the rest of my life but it won't be as serious as it was when I worked in the federal prison system. And before I, I stopped denying I had stress. After I left the military, I had stress, but it was aggravated by the fact that I worked 12, 10, 12, 13 hours a day. I worked on a bachelor's degree working 13 hours a day. And I worked on the master's degree working 13 hours a day. I got my PhD when I was working all of that aggravated my stress condition. 
so now I would say that this book, um, and I've read it, guys, if you are dealing with stress yourself, mm -hmm. you will find that Dr. Mahone's transparency lets you see you're not alone. And some of the ways that he coped with his stress, even though he had to function as a leader. And if you are in the mental health game, then this book can also serve as a great case study for you to share. So there you have it, folks. Dr. Melvin Mahone, my guest today, author of Coping with Stress and Building Leadership, One Man's Journey. You can find that book at your favorite bookstore, or you can check it out at drmahone.com. I will put that spelling for you in the credits. Dr. Mahone, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you so much.